Humanities gave me about five pages on how I should introduce our guest speaker. <laughs> I emailed Tracy and said, but this is Yahats. We just don't do things that way. <laughs> so I am going to tell you how we selected Tracy Prince to come and do this presentation. This is the catalog that Oregon Humanities sends out for their events that they present every quarter. And it changes. It's not always the same events. We enjoyed the Chautauqua events when Oregon Humanities was doing Chautauqua. And we had several of their speakers come and do the presentations here. They have since switched their style of presentation. They call it the Conversation Project. I was a little leery of it first, but we had Dr. Richard Clinton here. It worked out well. And I'm sure tonight is going to work out well. So there's, I, I gave the list to each of the board members and said, put down the top three choices that you have. Dr. Tracy Prince came out number one. So that's the first person we called to come here. Um, Oregon Manning's also asked that each participant fill out an evaluation sheet on tonight's program. They use this to evaluate whether or not that presenter or that program is going to be on the next quarter or the following quarter or another quarter. Just mm -hmm. please welcome Dr. Tracy Prince. <laughs> And if you are interested in purchasing, I have this handy um, swiper from credit cards uh, for my books. But um, they're on a totally different topic, as you can see. So is this going to work at all? It's not going to work. So just, go, just do without it. Um, so um, my first book was on my neighborhood in Portland. Um, Goose Hollow has a quirky name. And the next book is the only academic book. I'm a professor, and I, I hope to never write one of these, an academic book ever again. <laughs> because um, even though I write in a very accessible style, and it, I wrote it to my mother, who you know doesn't have a PhD, and I wanted her to be able to understand it, it's still kind of preaching to the choir. And this one is sold at Costco, and is a picture history. And, and the publisher allows no more than 75 words per caption. So it really sold me on uh, having a more accessible history. And so, anyway, so that, that's what I have um, going. Oh, and I wanted, if you want to keep um, connected with me um, on Twitter or Facebook. So, <clears throat> this is the old Chautauqua series kind of revamped, and we're supposed to be having a conversation. So I wanted to steer the conversation a little bit and just say, what differentiates Native American art in Oregon? I need to be able to see this. Um, what differentiates Native American art in Oregon from Native art in other parts of the Pacific Northwest? How much do we know about Native, Oregon's Native American art and history? And then what are the iconic images that seem to represent Native American art of Oregon? So I'm going to start out with something that is not Oregon, but everybody thinks is Oregon. I taught at the University of British Columbia for three years. And I collected with what little money I had from teaching um, there are 30 different native art shops in Vancouver, BC. The Van native art is alive and well. And um, I, you know, would buy a little bitty car of the raven's head or, you know, something like that. And when I came to Oregon, I said, I collect art of the Pacific Northwest. And then I joined the Native American Art Council at the Portland Art Museum, and we all care about learning about native art. I do not collect native art of the, of mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest. That's particularly British Columbia and Alaska, has almost nothing to do with Oregon. So what you're looking at are incredible totem poles. Could we get a little less light? I think you're going to be able to see. Can we turn any of the lights out? Or Oh, that's a little better. Um, maybe, I know you're trying to videotape, so just, just a Is that OK for everybody? OK, okay so you can see the totem poles there. I love this. This is the legend of Zunaqua. Zunaqua um, always has pursed lips like that. Because the, the legend was, it's like Hansel and Gretel. The legend is to keep children from wandering out into the forest where they might get lost. Zunaqua, they told the little children, is going to get you if you go out into the forest. 
and she captures the kids and she puts them in her basket, but the kids always found a way to cut out of the, their way out of the bottom of the basket. But this is an image that was depicted on longhouses, totem poles, but it's very British Columbia and Alaska, Haida and Tlingit and tribes like this. These button blankets, gorgeous, but they're not Oregonian. So then we go to the, um, the uh, 2010 Olympics. And look at all of this native iconography. I was just struck with how all of Canada summed itself up with these quintessentially native images. All of Canada said, welcome world, come to Canada. And this is what it means to be Canadian, which I thought was striking and interesting. And I thought, what if we hosted the Olympics in Oregon, which we never will, and there was a Portlandia episode about that. Um, <laughs> but um, what if we did? And what if we said, welcome, world. This is what it means to be or a, you know, Oregonian. What would those images be? And I, I couldn't even come up with the answers. And so that's why I proposed this, this um, topic. And so you see these, you know, the ovoid um, designs. You see an Inuit, which is the politically correct term for Eskimo. Eskimo prefer to call themselves Inuit because Eskimo means it's the tribe just below them that called them those strangers. <laughs> so um, th that's an Inuit Inukshuk. And these were tall um, uh, stone markers that marked the way in an in a, um, uh, arid terrain. So what would our image be? So that's, that's part of the thing I want you to be thinking about and see if any uh, any images or any geometric shapes or, you know, what jumps out at you. And then this is the thing that just blew me away was that this is in the Portland Art Museum in a section titled Native Art from the Pacific Northwest, but everything you see in this image is British Columbia and some, a little bit Alaska. <coughs> There's Zunaqua. This is a Zunaqua feast dish. It's quite spectacular. It was collected in 1900. Um, I, took, I went above and took an image below, above. You can see her pursed lips, and then you see the individual feast dishes which, within the, the, the carving. It's taller than me. It's a spectacular piece, but it is not Oregonian. So here is one of the amazing carved wooden masks. This is a, trans, a, a, a transformation mask. And it, the dancer is dancing and telling a legend in the tribe. And then the dancer pulls a string and the whole uh, mask pops open and then it transforms into a different figure that's also part of the story. And so that's a spectacular mask. It should be in a museum. It's amazing. And then you see this is a whale and there's some ravens and that, all of that is British Columbia. So let's move to Oregon. And I just wanted to give, I, there are so many smaller tribal groups that some of them don't even exist anymore. Some of them were decimated by smallpox and other diseases with the European interaction. But this gives you a sense of the different um, language groups and tribal groups. So one of the problems we're dealing with, with, with which is the reason um, we generally can't come up with some standard images in our head about native art in Oregon, is this. In the 1950s, 109 tribes were terminated throughout the United States, and 62 were in Oregon. It was a, des a cultural decimation. Nine, the nine federally recognized tribes that we have um, in 97, um, or 77, the Confederated Tribes of Silence, was the second tribe in the U.S. to achieve restoration. They worked very hard to get that acknowledgement that they exist. The Cow Creek Band of Umquads, that acknowledgement in 82 and 83, the tribes of the Grand Ron, 84, um, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos Lower um, um, Umqua and Sayusla, 86, Klamath, 89, Coquille and, or uh, Coquel, okay, I put this, Coquille for the city, Coquel is how the tribe says it's pronounced. There are three other federally recognized as tribal groups in Oregon. Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, which is where groups of Native people from Washington and Oregon were force marched on their Trail of Tears to the, that area uh, for the Treaty of 1855, the Confederated Tribes from the Treaty of 1855, and the Burns Paiute established in 1872. So 
I found it just surprising when a friend of mine who's obsessed with streetcars found this incredible streetcar pass. So in 1937, people in Portland were walking around with a weekly streetcar pass, and this was what was on it. And if you just, if we try to break this down, what are the messages being sent in this streetcar pass? And it says, it has sort of stereotypical um, sort of wild Indians, and the army is chasing them. It's kind of a Nevada or Arizona terrain. During the Civil War, Oregon troops spent the time exterminating hostile Indians in their villages. So, um, so let me just explain one thing quickly. Number one, it's supposed to be a conversation, but I find that wherever I go, I want to give all these images. I want to take the knowledge up to a place where it hasn't been. I have a lot I need to convey. So I would like for you to jump in, and the conversation will occur as we go through these slides and we discuss this. So please join in, please give your comments. But what do you think the message was being conveyed here? It's 1937, the word extermination hadn't become loaded uh, with the World War II atrocities of the Holocaust. So it seems almost, when I, when I read it, it seems almost bragging. Um, does anybody have any any take on that? Why why would they show what appear to be Plains Indians? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the Modocs were one of the last tribes to hold up. And and Oregon uh, and Oregon troops were were helping to round them up. Well, yeah, they were on the defensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think is that because Oregon is, wasn't part of that whole, are you north or are you south, who are you fighting for in the Civil War, that they just, in my mind, they're kind of just trying to prove their allegiance. Look at us. We were doing some good stuff out in the Civil War. We were, you know, rounding up the hostile Indians. Um, so in, it seems like it's celebrating some kind of Oregon history. And, of course, we find this repulsive today. But in 1937, this was a proud statement. And so I just wanted to get our head around why we don't have more Native art and history that's more a part of our conversation throughout the state. And so um, let's go through. I'm going to take them from down the Columbia River. We'll start um, for the Warm Springs, which were the tribal, where the tribal groups around here were, were forced to go to. And then we'll head over to the eastern part of the state and then go back around. So just to take you through um, the, the places. So we have over 20,000 pictographs and petroglyphs in the state. Many of those are endangered and are unprotected. Along the Columbia River, this, this, was take, this is an image that's near the Dalles, and it's just rich with uh, petroglyphs there. And some of the Chinook-speaking peoples along the Columbia River, like the Wasco, now live in Salilo Village or in the Warm Springs Reservation. And other tribes at the Warm Springs are the Walla Walla, later called the Warm Springs, and a small band of Paiutes. Do we know how old those are? 10,000 years old. There's, uh, but, but there have been um, pictographs. So um, petroglyphs are carved into the stone. Pictographs are painted onto the stone. But the mineralization sort of preserves it. There have been some that they found with, with gun, people on horseback with guns. And so petroglyphs were being done even in the earliest interaction with um, European people. So I, I love, I can't say that, I, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce the native name for she who watches. But what I find interesting is one of the most important images for um, groups around the Columbia River is actually on the Washington side. But it's important, you know, that didn't mean anything to the tribal groups then. There was no state line. And so this image is quite significant. Um, uh, this is an early etching or a drawing that was done by uh, an explorer in the 1850s. And what it shows us is life along the Columbia River. And we'll look, take a look at the prow of the canoe and see the 
animal effigy that's on the prow of the canoe, the longhouse um, style, you know, these things will start to come through. Here's an interior, an 1846 interior of a longhouse. There's a child keeping over there. So a place to sleep, place to store things, place to hang things for drying. There was almost always some kind of uh, animal or human type effigy there, and then the hole to let the smoke out. This is an Edward Curtis photo on the Columbia River around uh, 1900. Do you see the animal effigy on the prow of the ship? The basketry hats. And we start to see some things that have a cohesive image throughout Oregon. This is a spectacular longhouse that was recreated on the banks of the Columbia River in Ridgefield, Washington, which is about uh, 30 minutes north of Portland. Um, and this was actually the actual site, it's been uh, verified with um, archaeological digs, where Lewis and Clark inter um, interacted with tribal groups along the Columbia River. And they wrote, Clark wrote in the journal in 1805, I observed on the channel, which passes on the starn side of this island, a short distance above its lower point, is situated a large village, the front of which occupies nearly one quarter of a mile fronting the channel, and closely connected, I counted 14 houses in front here, the river widens to about one and a half miles. And this is the precise spot. So they've recreated a plank house, and it's a very faithful rendition of what um, Lewis and Clark would have seen. And this is the interior, um, which gives you a sense of what's there. And you see this um, design here. You'll see those ribs showing on up and down the Columbia River, a lot of the Chinook-speaking people. And it's unknown what that means. Is it about starvation? Is it a time of famine? Is it um, sort of honoring the dead because the, the ribs are showing? It's unknown. Mm -hmm. um, it looks to me like a backbone of a fish. I know the salmon is very important to well, these I know, I thought about that. <laughs> oh my goodness, I think you're right. She says that she thinks that it looks like it's the, 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 rib, the bones of a fish. Yeah. That is wonderful because I, I've been struggling with I have why I haven't seen more salmon imagery in basket weaving or petroglyphs or I've been trying to find them and I found a few basketry items um, at the High Desert Museum in Bend, um, but not as much as you would think considering how important salmon were. Uh, to all of the, you know Oregon tribes, that's and I I would like to concur with her because I've done some studying on the Northwest Coast art and tried to con convert some of my ideas from that to Oregon and those uh, those S those shared S ribs in the Northwest one mm -hmm. I kind of adapted them to some fish designs similar to that wow. so. Thank you. This is this has been driving me crazy trying to think about why this would be showing up all over the place, up and down the Columbia River. And I think you're you're right. It could be a combination of those things as well. Um, so just to give you a feeling about um, some of I, I tried to go from the earliest days to a contemporary artist in each of the tribal groups, and I just really appreciated how this showed how a canoe would be carved or planks would be removed from a tree pre-metal um, uh, um, you know, uh, tools. And this was fascinating to show you know, the, wo the, the woven cedar bark clothing was practically waterproof. And that was a consistent item all the way up from uh, southern Oregon and northern California actually all the way up to Alaska. That was a very common thing. So this is how it was harvested, and then that's quite a lot of uh, cedar bark and then taken home and woven. And then this actually has been used, studied, to try to recreate some of the patterns to weave that together. Um, so a friend of mine who collects historical photos and just finds them at garage sales, um, based upon the album that this was in, there was a lot of information that we know. It was so amazing to me to find an actual native family um, trading baskets in Portland because a lot of this history is completely lost. So in my 
um, use Hollow Book, I wanted to research um, my neighborhood, and I had never read much of anything. It always said, oh, Native people really didn't. Um, they just passed through a clearing on, on the Willamette River in Portland. But the more I started studying, um, so the Oregonian archives, a lot of newspapers are, archives are now digitally, um, di uh, digitally available so that you can sit at home in your jammies researching by keyword terms instead of scrolling through microfiche and microfilm. And so I found evidence of Native people in, in Portland that had never been put in a history book, ever. In 1845, before Portland was even incorporated, there were 275 European people and there were a thousand Indians. And that has never made a history book. And I only stumbled across it in like an 1870s uh, Oregonian article. So I was constantly looking for this hidden history, this history that the, the historians didn't write about and so it didn't get repeated. So to me it was amazing to see that there, was, there were groups passing through um, Portland selling. Uh, this is near the Dalles. We get a sense of the beadwork that's on the bag. Nancy. What's that? Is your name Nancy? Tracy. 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 Um, I, had Ed, I have Edward Curtis's big, thick books of his beautiful photographs, but they were taken, you know, later than what they looked like they were from because he would set the stage yes. for Native Americans to dress as they did. Mm -hmm. And so it, when you look through the book with my uneducated eye, I wouldn't know if it were now or 1860 mm -hmm. or earlier. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting how he did that. And that, it's absolutely true. He would often put a Navajo blanket underneath them or as a backdrop and he would bring in props and so you have to look at it uh, with an eye for what would be known to be seen in that area and so I, I tried not to include any of the ones that I felt like were just much too contrived um, but um, I love this because cradle boards were an opportunity um, to create a lot of artistry so the cradle boards um, were uh, beaded and had lots of interesting uh, weaving. And uh, this one I put in my book, uh, and I was so happy to be able to show a picture of Native people uh, near my neighborhood. Um, love this story. Pat Courtney Gold is a Wasco Chinook artist. This basket is held by the Harvard Peabody Museum, and it was collected by Lewis and Clark in 1805. And this basket is her tradition. It was collected on the Columbia River. And if you look at the designs here, she actually went to the Harvard uh, Peabody Museum and said, I'm Wasco, that's a Wasco basket, can I please study that? And she studied the basketry, the, the type of weaving, and then this is her honoring that story and she does an incredible job traveling throughout the state teaching people to weave. You don't have to be native, she'll teach anybody to weave. But she's really one of the people trying to re reclaim um, some of the lost territory. There we go. Okay. That's okay. I kind of needed to look sideways anyway. Okay, now I don't have to shout. Um, so um, what we find a lot in Oregon is a lot of work to reclaim heritage that has been lost. Um, Lillian Pitt is internationally known, incredible treasure for Oregon, and um, one of her great works, I think, is this lovely sculpture that's on the campus at the Central Oregon Community College in Bend. And as you can see, do you remember the um, She Who Watches? Um, Lillian is quite influenced by um, She Who Watches. This is fascinating to me. This is an, this is, um, a, an ancient petroglyph found near Portland um, on Sobe Island. Um, and then this is Lillian Pitt's contemporary commentary. And you look at this petroglyph, which once again we see the ribs showing. 
which I find fascinating. And then Lillian Pitt plays with that and has a sort of she who watches thing there. So let's move over to the Matilda, or actually, I'm going to take you all the way over. The Nez Perce um, were their tribal lands now are not in Oregon, but historically they were. So in Oregon's Hell's, Hell's Canyon, the petroglyphs, which I find they look almost alien-like, um, near the Nez Perce National Forest. Um, I thought that was an interesting image. A 1900 postcard that depicts Nez Perce and Umatilla tribes gathering for a powwow. And we'll talk about, look, these headdresses would have been much more traditional than what was there at, at European contact. And I always thought that it was Hollywoodization that changed that to the giant Plains Indian headdress that you see here. But this, obviously, 1900 was well before Hollywood. So it was, a, it was a many different reasons that brought this sort of Plains Indian headdress to become Pan Indian. And that was um, interaction with Plains tribes. It was exposure to the army colonel who gave deference to the guy with the bigger headdress. It was a lot of different things that um, created that. Uh, we'll go down to, oh sorry, Umatilla. Uh, this is a 15,000 year old petroglyph that um, for 86 years was, was carved out of the rock and for 86 years sat at Portland City Hall was moved back to the Umatilla lands in 1996. Right, he, right here it has chalk in the, in the grooves so that you can see the different designs. And here it doesn't have the chalk in there. Could I, could I make a comment about this? Of course. Uh -huh. uh, in the 1950s, I was a commercial fisherman and then I uh, became a fish buyer for the uh, canneries. And uh, this is in the Bellingham area. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my jobs was to go on to Lummi Island with the Lummi Island tribe. Wow. And uh, I, I bought fish from them. And they would invite me in. And they were just the most wonderful people. Very, very low key, although they were obviously very poor. And uh, interestingly enough, they had teepees which isn't mm -hmm. Northwest Indian style, obviously, Plains Indian. But uh, they were using those teepees in the summer, and they would put them on the, on the beach of Lummi Island. And uh, so I'd drive out my truck, and then we'd sit on the beach and, and uh, talk to them, and I'd buy fish from them and uh, put cannery. And I was surprised about that, but then they told me that they had lost so much of their heritage in that particular area mm -hmm. that they adopted the teepee from the Plains Indians just to maintain some of their ancestry, even if it wasn't exactly correct, and the feeling of the tribe. And it was interesting to see those teepees sitting on the stony beaches in Lomi Island. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know, uh, what would have been in that area, and in our area, before European contact, would have been just some bent um, branches into what was called a wigwam. So it would have been round, and it would have had um, woven uh, cedar bark uh, mats over the top of it to make it practically waterproof. Um, however, and I used to have a problem, I used to think, um, you know, oh, it's, it's a, this sort of romanticized, idealized image of Native people. This, you know, the giant headdress and a teepee. But what I had to come think about, what I had to think about was, I believe I am expecting a culture to remain frozen in time. And I believe I'm expecting a culture to be exactly as it was at contact, at European contact. And that's, of course, not logical. Um, and that their interaction with other tribes, um, a, a lot of tribal groups were using teepees even in the 1870s. 
So by that time, this sort of wigwam uh, with the bent um, uh, branches had transferred to a teepee, which would have been more like the Plains Indians. And so I think that um, we just have to say to ourselves, I mean, there were no totem poles at European interaction, um, at first European interaction with, with uh, Oregon tribes. There are now probably a thousand totem poles in Oregon, but is that not tribal culture here? Because if a tribal culture here says, that influences me, that is how I want to define myself. We, they're free to not be completely frozen in time, so. Uh -huh. I'd like to make one more comment. Uh, they, the terrible conditions they lived in for years and years and years. Uh, finally, because of the, <laughs> many people know this, because of the, uh, a glitch in the law, uh, in certain places you, you couldn't have any casinos, but on the Indian land they could. Mm -hmm. And so now the Indians, many of the tribes, have benefited from having the casinos on and they're living in a much better, and I have a couple of personal friends, and they're living much better now than many of us. And I say, great, that's for you. <laughs> so I, I just want to make that comment that maybe, maybe they had a chance to, to come back on that. Yes, uh, yes. Uh -huh. I followed the uh, tribal uh, issues in Canada for quite a while, but rather looked up there as we involved in it. There was a period for about, I thought about 15 years, when it was not considered right to use the phrase totem poles. It now seems to have come back. Are you, are you aware of what went on and why now it seems to be okay? And I wanted to talk about my use of the word Indian. Um, yeah. So um, when I lived in Canada, I would have never used it. It would have been almost, the, the room, people in the room would have recoiled as if I used a racial slur. It, First Nations is the preferred term in Canada. Um, or uh, indigenous people, aborigine, aboriginal people, um, you would never hear um, Indian. But we live in a country where at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., you can go to the American Indian Museum, and we have tribal people who call themselves Indian and say, I don't, you know, I don't feel comfortable with Native American. And so I use the term Native American and Indian, but I, I qualify that by saying, you know, it's sometimes appropriate. It, you know, I, when I'm doing, when I write, I always use Native American. But on the, on the totem pole issue, it's, it's gone back and forth. What people, Native people want to, want to be called in Canada has gone back and forth even in the last 10 years. When I lived there, I left in 2001, uh, First Nations was the preferred term, and it's now more Aboriginal or Indigenous um, as they're making more connections among indigenous people around the world and acting politically together. So those, it just comes and goes. And, uh, you know, I always defer to what people would prefer to be called. So, um, so that's true of totem also? Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's okay to say totem. <laughs> did you have a comment back, I thought somebody did back there? Okay. Um, so I, what I love about, so I wanted to start pointing out to some things that do seem to go all the way across Oregon. And the basketry hat with the geometric shape, and then it shows up in other basketry items, seems to be very typical. As you can see, this woman is posed on either a Pendleton blanket or a Navajo woven blanket. Um, and she's got uh, quill work and bead work, and the, the um, cradle board is slightly different from the one we saw before. This has everything in it. It has beadwork around with the anklets, um, beadwork on the bag, lots of quill work, dentalium shells, corn husk bags with wonderful geometry. This would have been maybe a berry picking um, basket. But it, I'm trying to give you a lot of images so that you can get a sense of, of, of uh, what we would put on our button that we sell to tourists when we have the Olympics. So. <laughs> Here's James Labrador, a Walla Walla artist, um, who helped found the Crow Shadow Institute of the Arts. And this is a very important institute that teaches young Native people printmaking, carving, uh, uh, metallurgy, things that will help them be successful as a Native artist. 
and I love this series of paintings that are all inspired by the Blue Mountains, where it's, which is near their reservation. And then we'll go to the Burns Paiute, just to give you some petroglyphs and pictographs in that area, and to give you a sense of where this is coming from, the Millican Valley. This is a heartbreaking image, 1870s. The Indian agent is issuing blankets, tents, and clothing to the Paiutes in exchange for their land. Um, and you can see that uh, the, some of the, a lot of the Western clothing, we see uh, an elder, tribal elder, who's sitting right next to the agent, um, who is wearing a large headdress. And so we see how things are changing on the headdress and the teepee also. This is wonderful because it gives us so much visually of, of the different geometric patterns showing up on the basketry. Basketry used for cooking with, by putting hot rocks into water to make it boil. Uh, basketry hats, um, they're spectacular. And this is a Burns Paiute rabbit robe that ensured warmth during the winters in the high desert. And it took 200 to 300 rabbit pelts. And it is impossible to, to make today because the rabbits aren't as plentiful as they were before. And so this is um, Agnes ben Benning Hawley, and that, that was on the, the, the same picture was on the cover of the first Oregonian's book. And a Burns Paiute elder, Minerva Susi, who is weaving a basket here, and te she teaches younger people how to weave. And this is an 1890 Paiute water basket, which was completely waterproof and could haul water from the river, which is amazing. Another Burns Paiute elder who is, uh, teach, teaches basketry, and this is one of her cradle boards, Rena Beers. We'll move down to the Klamath. So there's a great, I love the name of this, Picture Rock Pass. And we see some of the um, pictographs there. And the, the contemporary Klamath tribe includes the Modoc and the Yahuskin. And this gives us quite a large uh, in, uh, uh, sampling of da the different basketry, obviously influenced by, you know, this is a tea kettle. This is apparently a, quite a rare pictorial quiver. And this basketry covering a bottle. That's hard work. I can't even imagine that. That must be very intricate. And this is what, this is the housing that would have been typical here. This is the bent, the bent um, um, branches, and the woven mats. And so that would have been what you would have seen unless you were at a longhouse. So this would have been more portable for seasonal movement. And this is a woman collecting tule which is a um, material used for um, basketry. And then we see this incredible, this huge basket, and you can see the tump line on the basket and see how useful the basketry hat is because it's keeping that tump line from digging into her forehead. And she's also carrying a, a basket that has some elaborate designs on it. Edward Curtis, 1905, gathering some of the you know, this is a, with a drum I thought was fascinating. Um, this is the Klamath Reservation, and I believe they're um, smoking something there. It's a little hard to tell. And the contemporary um, artist, Jim Jackson, who's a sculptor. And just look at the headdress and the sculpt. That would have been much more typical of pre-European contact. And this painting, I like the name, New Old Medicine by Amanda Wright. And then we'll move over to the Cow Creek Umquas. And there's um, petroglyphs at Medicine uh, Creek um, rock art, or pictographs. Um, and there's evidence that the Native people have been in that area for 8,000 years. This is an 1840s drawing done by an early um, trader um, called a Winter Lodge of the Umqua Indians. And so it, we see that it's very similar to the lodge that was uh, interacted, that Lewis and Clark interacted with. We see the smoke coming out of the hole in the roof. This man is carving a paddle. The woman is holding a baby in a cradle board. And so we see some similarities. 
This is the graves of the Umpqua Indians. And the basketry was turned over a sharp point. I don't know what that symbolized, but it gives us a, a sense of how uh, the, the grave sites were decorated and revered. This is a woman who is in very European style Victorian dress, but done with lots and lots of beadwork. This is an incredible amount of work. And then look at how they, the basketry hat has even had a little addition to make it sort of more of uh, what the style might have been at the time. And a Cow Creek woman, um, Susan Nata Thompson, with just a very utilitarian basket. You see the same, the geometric shapes that were common throughout there. Or, or for, this is um, south of, of um, Cow Creek, but I just wanted to give us a, a sense of uh, different tribal uh, headdresses. I have no idea what that feather is. Do we have anybody who can... Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> um, it, could, it could be condor, I don't know. Um, but it's not anything I recognize. So we'll move up to the Coke Well. And these are basketry items in their um, uh, exhibit at the Milk Mill Casino Hotel. And you notice that a lot of these have a lot of, um, they're sort of open basketry. And a lot of those were used for clam digging and uh, other things, uh, hauling fish and that sort of thing. Tracy, you could try sending the headdress photo to the Audubon Society. <gasps> awesome. <laughs> I love that. Set the bird up for Ooh, are they really that long? Yeah, the, like, oh, yeah. the oh, that would make a lot of sense. Um, it would, because I don't know what a condor, somebody suggested condor, and I said, I don't have any idea what that would have been like, but I love that, and I will send that. I, they will be, there will be some, somebody geeking out over that one, and I'll tell them that's thanks to y'all. Uh -huh. I met you this afternoon uh -huh. while I was uh, yes, at, the, at the museum. In the uh -huh. And you looked at some of the artifacts. Do you have any comments on the artifacts? Yes, so there, you actually have um, some native basketry and some beadwork. And I would encourage you, they're currently unmarked in the, in the museum. Yeah. And I would encourage you to um, uh, talk with um, Robert Kenta or some other people who can really pin it down and mark it and really celebrate that because you have some quite nice pieces there, but they are just sitting there unmarked. And so I, I really think that, you know, to be able to touch and feel a history that connects to this earth, you know, is really very cool. And, and, and yeah. there was a lot of trade among the Indians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, things would move way up from Mexico all the way up to Oregon. Mm -hmm. And the Spanish influence then would gradually penetrate up here even for the English. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah, uh, and the Spanish sounding uh, names that we have in Oregon that are uh, after explorers, it's amazing. But the other fascinating thing that was the horse, because the horse wasn't very practical in Oregon, while in the plains it uh, changed the whole perception of who was boss and how to run things. Mm -hmm. So the, they drove a lot of the Indians west and they kept penetrating with different cultures into the existing culture even long before the white man got into it. Oh, absolutely. Yes, the, you know, you, the, the cultures interacted and, and traded. Gentalium shells come from the west coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Uh, but they were incredibly useful, and you, you'll see later, you'll see they're showing their wealth by these amazing, you know, quadruple strands of dentalium shells. Um, did you have a comment? Yes. Have you had the fortune to visit the, uh, in, in the Eugene, the um, Museum of Natural History? I have not. I, I've There's heard. a that, couple of us that know the director, and he is very succinct on his pieces, mm -hmm. and he might even know about those feathers, too. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's a fabulous place. Well,
Well, the, the places that I felt like they do a great job of telling you about that place. And I think Oregon needs to do a much better job across the board. But there's no place I can go in Portland and understand the Native people who were in the region um, before. There's not a single museum that I can go to. I can go to um, Oregon City and the uh, Museum of the Oregon Territories, I think it's called, has an excellent display, but it's only you know, about a quarter of the size of this room, but it's quite excellent. Uh, the High Desert Museum in Bend, it's exceptional. Because you go there, and through their displays, you, you understand the tribal groups that were there, even the tribal groups that were there seasonally. It, I really felt like it grounded you to the sense of place. And I, I, I would just encourage you, especially with this great Native history, the, the name Yaha, it's everything, to really ground you know, that sense of place and to um, accept celebrate that and teach that in, in the museum because that, that's what I think we could do a better job and we would know what our uh, icons are. So let, um, just getting through the, the, you see that there's some geographic shapes that are, that are repeating themselves throughout the, the, the um, tribal groups. Acorn soup being made by dropping hot stones into water and this is on um, uh, culture days that they have where they te try to ch teach the young people how to interact with that. I wanted to show you a totem, just to show you that totems do exist in Oregon, but they, are, they weren't here in uh, 1845. Um, this is just a great story. Um, Brenda Mead um, talks about this. She, she did this necklace as honoring her ancestors here, and that little girl is wearing a similar necklace. This, the coin necklace is inspired by a story taken from the book White Moccasin, written by my great-grandmother, Beverly Ward. Um, her book talks about the history of our family, the Nasoma Band of the Coquel Indian Tribe, which was located in the Bandon area. The story talks about how Charlie Ned, this is him, my great-great-great-grandfather had done some work for a man and was paid in gold coins. The coins which were used to make a necklace, were greatly admired by his young daughter, Lily Ned, who liked to play with the necklace. Lily passed at a very young age and was buried according to tradition with her toys and with the special gold coin necklace. This piece was produced using contemporary Sacagawea gold dollars and is worn during our traditional dance to honor my personal family history. So I thought that was a profound way to show you both the history and a contemporary artist. And then in Co Coquel, uh, this is Sherrod Yonker who teaches wood carving and boat building. And as you can see, we see the animal effigy on the front of the, of the canoe. And they have started, uh, I think it's called Canoe Journeys. Does anybody know? I always get the name wrong. But they've started a meetup where they get their people their young, they want their young people in a boat on the water because that was their tradition. And so tr different tribal groups meet up from southern Oregon all the way up to Alaska and they'll say, we're going to meet up in Puget Sound at, with this particular tribe and they've got to get there. They've got to build a boat and they've got to get there. And that simple act has been really inspiring a lot of cultural um, uh, revision of cultural traditions and pride. We had the project here in town last year, and the, and the kids helped build, carve out the boat, but then when they went and floated it, none, none of them could go, but the boat went down to one of these meetings where there's a, there's a Native American man in our area here who took time mm -hmm. weekly to help the kids carve out the boat. It was over here by the picnic shelter for a long time. Wow. That, but they just couldn't because of their schedule? Yeah, it was a schedule. Oh, okay. Well, what an incredible thing that they're... They're learning the skill of carving. They're they're getting reconnected with what was you know the hot, the the river and the ocean were the highways, and so there's a great sense of uh, getting a, you know having the skills to get around on the water highways as they used to. So this the boats aren't carved out; they are made of the cedar planks, aren't they? Uh, the, everybody does it differently, and some people use commercially bought purchase boats because they, they don't have the time or the skills. But uh, the, the Indians used to make cedar planks and make their... 
you know they would burn out a log. They, they would uh, take a, an intact log and carve out the center. You, you, sometimes burning it out in the middle to soften the wood there. Um, but it would be one entire log, um, not different planks pieced together. That would be the, what, how it would have been done originally. And they're even wearing the woven basketry hats. So, you know, it's fascinating to see them reclaiming. I think we're heading up to Selects. Yes. Oh, no. Um, Coos, Lower Umqua, and Sayusla. Um, so this is on the website of the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umqua, and Sayusla. But this is actually, I'm not going to tell them this, but this is actually um, on the Columbia River taken by um, Edward. Edward S. Curtis. Um, however, as we saw from the, the, the canoes that were lower uh, down the coast than they were, this is completely typical, um, that, that animal effigy canoe. And the more, if a canoe um, needed to be used on the ocean, then the prow was even bigger in order to navigate those waters. Um, uh, Lewis and Clark talked about um, uh, is it um, desolation? What is it called at the mouth of deception? Deception, deception pass or point. point? Deception point. They talk about they talked about having to hunker down through a, just a terrible storm, and how they didn't dare get out on the water. And, and the you know the water at the mouth of the Columbia is quite um, difficult <laughs> to to uh, go through. It's one of the most dangerous bars in the world. And as they were sitting there, hunkered down scared to get out in their boats, some native women came over in some canoes and sold them some, some food so that they could get along. And the point was, there they were terrified to, to get out on the water and it was just a terrible storm and the women were so comfortable at, you know, maneuvering in the canoes. And I thought that was really great because it showed the, you know, uh, the ability to manage themselves on the water. Um, Sayusla women and a baby, and this gives us, this is called a, a dress, but it, it's a woven skirt and it has lots of jingly things that uh, when uh, dancing are just walking. Basketry hats, we see some extra feathers added as extra sort of decoration. And then we come to a contemporary artist, tribal elder, uh, Sue Perry Olson. And like a lot of people in the stories we've heard today, she had to research in newspaper archives and museums and universities and interview elders to learn how to do some of the weaving that had been lost. And she's working to reintroduce the tribal weaving and beading techniques to her tribe. And we'll go up to the Celeste. Um, this is an 1840s drawing of Yaquina Bay Indians. Um, in Newport today, they would be called Celeste, but as you know uh, from the history locally, there were uh, dozens of different bands of, of native people. And the Celeste Confederation today is made up of 27 bands whose ancestral homelands range from California to Washington. So this is a drawing of the, one of the earliest uh, moments of interaction. When I gave a talk in Newport, people were pointing out that this may be, you know, sort of the old waterfront the, the, um, where the fishing still happens today, that that might be that right there, which would be fascinating. So let's, you can see that there are a number of, of long houses or plank houses on the beach, just right smack on the beach. We pay attention to the headdresses that they're wearing, which would have been before they became introduced to the Plains Indian headdresses. I don't know what they're holding. Does anybody have any guess about, I mean, what's that? It's called a maddish. What is that? It's made out of And it's feathers woven together? Yeah, they're, they're um, tied together and then there's a, a handle wrap. Oh, wow. Wow, that's, I never, I always, I look, I mean, it's clear that they're holding something significant and almost kind of presenting it, but I didn't know what it was. Uh -huh. A woman recently brought one of them to my husband to uh, uh, make a wooden handle for one of them. Uh, we, we've just moved here from Scapula. Mm -hmm. And the neighbor's path goes. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, my gosh. And um, my husband was a work worker, and someone brought it. Uh, it was actually the wing. It wasn't just feather, uh, and, and it um, needed a, a new handle thing around the 
contain? I don't know what part of the bowl That would make perfect sense. Thank you, because I've been wondering. I, I thought it might be baleen, but I didn't know why they would be holding it. And it didn't really look like baleen, but. Robert Kenta would be a good person to add, because he um, and Bud Lane mm -hmm. do a lot of the building of the traditional regalia that's danced in the solstices. And when the Dance House of Celeste was first opened, um, uh, many pieces were brought back from the Smithsonian, and members of the Smithsonian were there, and, um, and they were danced again for the first time since Oh my gosh, yeah. that's really powerful. <laughs> breathtaking. Wow, you were there? We were. <sighs> Lucky you. That's, that, how long ago was that? You know, this one is 15 now and she's a little baby. So oh my gosh. Not that long ago. Well, it, you know, it's that exactly what we're going. We don't have 30 galleries even in the state that sell native art. Um, so we're in the reclamation phase, you know, when I lived in Vancouver and I had 30 galleries to choose from, we are nowhere near that. And so we're, we're just trying to reclaim some of these lost traditions, some of the decimation of cultures. Um, and this, this, the, this is the, one of the traditional dresses that Robert Kenta came to the Portland Art Museum and described um, that some of the um, uh, Elders are trying to bring back some of the more traditional dances, but they don't want, um, let me see if I, I'll, I'll show you a powwow picture in a minute, but they don't want people in the fancy dance um, regalia of the powwows dancing a traditional dance. And so they're saying, could you please go change into the traditional dress, which is this, this um, skirt, kind of an apron kind of thing. And so that we can have this dance traditionally. And they're working very hard to reclaim some of that. Um, and this is a woman who um, was in incredibly, I mean, there's a lot of wealth shown in this image. You see the massive amount of dentalium shells, which were traded as currency, and the incredible beading, and the basketry hat, and all, you know, there's all kinds of. Uh, this is a very important person, is what this image says, um, as far as um, the possessions and the quality of the work. Are or what's dentalium? Dentalium is a type of shell, and it's... Um, so is that, the, is that the crustacean? I don't know. The animal? It's, I, I don't know what grows in dentalium. Does it's anybody... It's Is it? Oh, it's is a it's a snail? It's a mollusk. A mollusk? A mollusk? So would they be like stuck onto a rock? How would it, how would somebody? I need to look that up. How would somebody harvest entailing? Does anybody know? Yeah, they're good. here. Let's go back. They're long. They're like they're they're thin, but then they're about as long as my finger. Um, yeah, all I know is that they're really prolific on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and so the tribes there were just like sitting on the mother load. So. <laughs> So I wanted to put this picture because we, I, you know, I do a lot of talking about how we're not like uh, Oregon tribes are not like British Columbia, but this is a Native woman in 1860, a medicine woman, a Coast Salish medicine woman, and I just want you to pay attention to the woven basket or a woven bark um, clothing, and then look carefully at the notched feathers there. That geometry repeats itself in basketry, and then. Um, and so the, the Coast Salish, um, the Celeste tribe, is the most closely associated with that. Um, uh, this is a contemporary powwow. And so I. Uh -huh. You said they were associated with Salish. How far south does the term Salish apply? Celeste. So that's, that that's the southernmost. That's the southernmost. So that goes how far north? Oh, to Alaska. To Alaska. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was a language, uh, you know, group. Um, but um, so I, I ran across um, in my research for other books. I've ran, I ran across a quote from um, an, a pioneer. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. This is um, a little bit later. Sorry, this was in the Oregonian, 
And it was talking about Pendleton powwows, which have been going on there for over 100 years. And it said, you know, back in the day, we used to be able to tell which tribes they came from by their regalia. But as we've been going year after year, it's less obvious which tribe they came from. And so you see this sort of um, pan-Indian um, aesthetic that tribal traditions get blended, people intermarry, they get uh, forced off of their traditional lands and some of the traditions get lost. But for a wide variety of reasons, that this is what now comes to represent going to a powwow and what it means to be a native person at a powwow. And it's completely normal for that, to, that, tra that tradition to change, but it would have been more differentiated per tribe um, later. Um, just to give you some great images, a friend of mine has these that have never been published, never been seen in public, and I just wanted to give you a special treat because it shows we think it's around 1910 and we think it might be a parade because Native people were often paid. In Portland I found many uh, evidence that they were paid to say, oh we're doing a 4th of July parade, can you please come and make sure you wear your regalia? And this would be in like 1870, 1890, 1910. Um, and then they would camp out in a nearby um, you know, piece of land and then they would march through town and, and give them the show that they wanted. So it's possible that this is what they were doing at Newport. But it gives us a lot of different, you know, just decked out in all of the different um, uh, regalia and the woven skirts. All these, and the feathers going straight up, which was fascinating because we saw that first image when it was just a few feathers here and there and then it would transfer from this to more sort of Plains Indian. This says he's the oldest on Indian of the Celeste tribe, a reformed bad Indian. <laughs> and these are spectacular pictures, and I'm sorry, I, I take, I show you a lot of pictures, and, but I, it's because I'm so amazed by, uh, you know, and look at the dentalium shells, and this woman almost looks like you know, she's like a fashion plate of the time. You know, it's quite a styling, you know, 1920s hat. Oh, and this right here is in the Newport Museum. The, what's the museum at Newport? Forget what the name of it is, but. Um, yes, and it's in the back where the native section is. This exact beaded skirt. I swear to you, it's there. So go look, and you'll see that exact, the beadwork is this exact same thing. I mean, I could hold that picture up to that uh, um, beaded skirt or dress or um, the regalia, and it seems to me like it's the exact same thing. I just about fell over. And here's a parade. You know, they're giving them their, their spectacle, which is what they probably paid for to have them parade through town. And then here's Robert Kenta, we've talked about and he was fortunate that there were a few elders, great-grandmothers, who still knew basket weaving and beading, um, but his own grandmother did not know, did not remember. She knew how to collect the, the materials and the grasses and say, well, if you collect them in a certain way, then you can keep collecting from the same area over and over again. So he just pieced the different information together. He also went to museums and he, he just found his way back to uh, all of the, the weaving traditions and beading traditions. And right here, I want you to pay close attention. Do you remember the medicine woman, the Coast Salish medicine woman from British Columbia? He said, he was giving a talk at the Portland Art Museum and he pulls this out and he says, I want to show you my, one of our most ancient, one, most traditional headdresses. And I just about fell over because that looks so much like, let's get back to her. There she is. Do you see the woven, Hat, the the notched feathers. Look at that, the notched feathers. So he was showing us one of his oldest, the oldest, most traditional uh, types of headdress regalia. Go to the Grand Ronde. The Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, just like the Celestes, are 27 different bands. 
and they range from the Cascade Range to the Oregon coast. And this is an 1841 drawing from the Charles Wilkes Expedition, which was an exploratory expedition. And there, they famously had a boat that broke up on the, um, the Columbia uh, River bar. And so they were stuck there trying to figure out what to do. And so there were lots of drawings of native life in that area because of that. So you get a drawing of the interior of life in a, a plank house. Uh, here's a, a woman with basketry I'm on the canoe or, or uh, on the ocean. And do you see this basket has lots and lots of holes because she's going clam digging. So it's to let the water go out. Uh, this was fascinating because the photo was labeled Coastal Native Woman by the Clatsop Historical Society. It's ID'd as a Yakima woman on, on the bottom. But in fact, she could have been Yakima who married into the tribe, so it could be both, both things are true. Some Grand Ron basketry items. And this is a contemporary artist, Stephanie Wood. And she is so unusual in all of these stories I've been telling you in Oregon is that she had an unbroken tradition. She was taught by her mother, who was taught by her mother, who was taught by her mother. And in this exhibit is, an, I believe it's this basket, that was woven by her great-great-grandmother, Hattie Hudson. And she's still weaving and teaching today. So I thought that was fascinating that it took me that long to find somebody could, who had an unbroken tradition. Now I'm going to head up to the mouth of the Columbia River. And uh, once again, from the Charles Wilkes expedition, we get some drawings uh, around this area. The Astoria Chinook Chief Concomly, this was his tomb, and the, a canoe would have at one time been across, been across the top there. And you see, it's hard to tell, that, but there are ribs showing on this um, uh, human figure here. And if you go to um, Astoria, then there's this cement replica of the um, burial. And this is a drawing of native life around the mouth of the Columbia River. You see the kind of larger prows on the canoes because they're navigating some pretty fierce water there. This is an 1840s Hudson Bay Company sketch at the mouth of the Columbia River. And this is at Fort Stevens State Park in Astoria. And there is a longhouse replica, and this is, you know, very similar to that image that's on the side of. Do you see how they've replicated that? I think they're ceremonial breastplates. Really? That's what it looks like. Well, it, that would make sense too, wouldn't it? Because I've always heard them referred to as ribs, but I mean, really, nobody has a definitive answer on that. But breastplate. That would make a lot of sense. Okay, we're going to end with this image, which I think is fascinating. 1841, the same Charles Wilkes expedition. They're they're camped out at the Columbia mouth of the Columbia River, and he the, the artist literally titles this "Indian Baskets of Oregon," which I thought was fascinating, and he collects them all together because that's what I'm trying to figure out here: is what are the images that are quintessentially Oregon tribes, and in, in my mind, this is still a really good example. Um, and people have asked me why um, it was native art in British Columbia so robust. Why, is, why are there still 30 galleries? Why are there still people carving like crazy up there? And it's not that the Canadian government um, was kinder and gentler to, their, to the native people because they ran them off of land that was more desirable. They took kids and forced them into um, uh, uh, boarding uh, schools. They forbade the speaking of the languages in the boarding schools. They, for they outlawed potlatches. But the reality is that Canada is this huge place. It has the population of California, and 80% of that population lives one hour from the American border. So it's a lot of land that is unoccupied. <laughs> And so people were able, native people were able to be fairly unmolested um, and could, could keep their um, sense of cultural traditions and they didn't have the hordes of people coming in and saying, oh, that's some free land, I'll take it, I'll homestead out here. And they didn't have what we had in Oregon, which is the land here, 
was just said, okay, free land, come on over, um, and the European people settled here. So it was simply a matter of numbers that they that the native people there had um, uh, less opportunity for um, completely being run over. But um, so, what are you? What do you guys think about what? What are we going to put on our button for the Olympics? What are our icons? Uh huh. Who's like somebody's? Asking that's a good oh, okay. You said that's a good question. Okay. Well, certainly the head basket. Oh, yes. The basketry hat. Yes. Yeah. That's seen. Mm -hmm. The shells. The detailing shells. Okay. She who watches. I'm sorry? She who watches. Oh. Yeah. Despite being in Washington, it's still, yeah. as you can see, <laughs> very important to Oregon. I like the feathers, the sculptured feathers. The sculptured feathers? Which, on, which notch, notch. <gasps> the notched feathers. Yeah. But wasn't that spectacular? Uh -huh. That that it was notched in that geometric shape. Oh, that would be really pretty too. It's the geometry that runs through all of this. The architecture, the basketry, the construction of the clothing. That's what holds it all together. Mm -hmm. um, how you? I, mean, I think the baskets. Easiest to see that, yeah. that and, and, and the volume. But it's, it's, uh, it's those patterns and it's that structure. The button should be woven. The button should be woven. <laughs> I, I love that. I think you've hit right, right on that. Um, you know, the world over, people have a great concept of the language of the art that's used in British Columbia, the Native American art. The world over, people know what's on a totem pole. They understand that language. So we're asking what is the Oregon Native art? What was the language? What, what are the motifs that keep coming up over and over and over? What do you see? What's that, sorry? People, uh, pretty country. Pretty country? Mm -hmm. I've read that it was different, but I've never seen anything other than that what looks kind of like a dog or some. I don't know what that was. A bear. A bear, you're right. Uh, that makes sense. I, I was thinking, what is that animal? That is the only one I've ever seen depicted in, in drawings or photos. But there are stories by Lewis and Clark and others that talk about different animals, animal effigies. So that could have become sort of homogenized even from 1805 to 1845. From Lewis and Clark to the wagons rolling across the prairies. I thought I read that even a lot of the canoes came from far north. I don't think they, so. The, the ones that were the most seaworthy came from the trays. The, the oh, I see what you're saying. So maybe the ones that had the bigger prows or... I gotta be the I, don't, I have never heard that before, but it doesn't mean that I haven't read the same thing you did. So I, I'll have to investigate that. Okay. I, I do think that the cops in particular with their seaworthy trays Mm -hmm. Yeah, the macaw definitely that that's their they're still known to this day for their sea seaworthiness. Uh -huh. Yeah, the material is dictated. Now, with the weaving, you get a lot of straight lines. With carving, you get the flow of the wood, and mm -hmm. uh, with stone, you get a different effect. So the art is dictated by what material you do. And do you have any ideas about why, um, of course, um, art in different regions is going to be different because it has different cultural influences, but why is the art so different from British Columbia to Oregon? And um, I, I mean, I, part of what I'm thinking is, I've been racking my brains trying to think, you know, they're so similar, they're, they share the Chinook trade language, they, interacted among each other. Mm -hmm. 
the uh, further north you got, the more they stayed in their longhouses. Down here, they're more nomadic, you know, according to the yeah. season. So um, I heard the totem pole is actually a product of some more natives being in the corner posts in the house. They can carve them. Uh -huh. yeah, you got to put that outside. That's too cool to be inside the house. That, that makes per they absolutely were far less nomadic um, further north. I don't know why because so you think they just built bigger long houses and then hunkered down and to, to get through the cold? Yeah. Well, they used to go down with the party and fish and then take it back into the end of it. So it wasn't just they lived along the river. They went there, but uh -huh. that was just part of their trade goods. Oh, every, every tribe in Oregon was nomadic. And seasonally nomadic, and they would have long houses, but they would also move quite frequently according to the season. Absolutely, but way more than Britain. You're right. I, I think that's it. That's. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, even though it's close, the climate is really, and many of you have been there, you know, I'm talking about that. the climate really is different. There is a lot of rain, but it's warmer at times. There's a, there's a lot of things going on up there mm -hmm. as far as uh, the inlets in and out, which may, may be contributed to the, to the boats. I'm only talking off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a lot of, as I said before, there were a lot of totem uh, poles up there and uh, different clothing that some of them wore uh, almost every day. But it, it, it wasn't fancy things, but, but it was the kind of change in the way they were in that area and what we see in the movies or in pictures or magazines. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't tell you what all the facts were, but it, 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 it's a fact. It's mm -hmm. a Absolutely. Thing. And it's so fascinating that, um, so I teach a group of um, German educators, and Germans love Native American stuff. It's, it's just a national obsession. Um, so they're really intrigued and they really want to know, but like most people around the world, I mean, I've lived in several different countries, and around the world there is, it's just kind of lumped in together that to be native North American means totem poles, teepees, and the big headdresses. But they're all, you know, from different cultural traditions, and so it's fascinating to me the things that the rest of the world kind of latches onto and says, oh, I respond to that. You know, artistically, I respond to that. And they are just drawn to it, and they're, that becomes what they fascinate, you know, they fixate on. And, and so again, part of my job was to, to try to figure out, you know, what, is, what are the artistic motifs in Oregon that we're drawn to? So as you, as you walk, look through the, the slideshow tonight, what were some of the things that you were drawn to that you maybe didn't know about Oregon's native history or art, or what were you drawn to? What what, what, what did you respond to and think I, I needed to know? That was interesting to me. Anybody have to see something that they didn't have any idea about? Mm -hmm. I love seeing the nature before it was changed or shifted or altered or manipulated, especially that Yaquina Bay image that was really cool. Thank you. Yeah, that was. I had no idea that that's what I was looking at, but when I gave a talk at Newport, they they were really like they came up afterwards and said, "Pull up that slide, pull up," and they all just stood there and studied it. And they said, "I swear, look at this and look at this," and they are pretty sure that that's that's what you're looking at. And I just thought that's so cool that we got to pin that down um, because there's so little knowledge, and and the, the problem we have is that and, you know I look at. Uh, Portland historians. They never mentioned that the earliest days of Portland there were a thousand Native people. They never mentioned it. And so the next historian who wrote a book was quoting from that one, didn't mention it. The next one didn't mention it. And so we have a problem in Oregon that we don't really know our history about na our Native, the Native history, the Native art. And so that's a pretty steep learning curve, and um, it would be great if we had even 30 Native art galleries in the state. <laughs> we don't even have that. Um, so it's uh, a lot of
trying to reconnect with this almost lost past that is being reclaimed. Something I think of is there's so many different tribes that were brought together into Select. Well, I think of the one. Select Grand Ronde, so, exactly. So you, you know a lot of the different artwork, different input, different survival. Um, they're all their own little stories. So it, it's hard to put it all into Oregon. Yes, it is. So I, yeah, scary and, broke down. And, and something else I think of are the arrowheads that are brought up and, you know, but they, the tools that were used to, to survive. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yes. I think the, the lack of understanding that we have with the stylistic uh, meaning of the, uh, of the work, like baskets, we have no idea what those uh, um, shapes mean. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe partly the key is understanding language and um, maybe working more in the languages of all the different diverse cultures here in mm -hmm. early Oregon. Uh, I'm really struck by how much I don't know about the abstracted language mm -hmm. that we're looking at. The motifs, yeah. yes. And, and trust me, um, I've given talks to uh, people who are members with me at the Native American Art Council at the Portland Art Museum, and they say, I have never heard any of this. And they're collectors. So this, right. is, this is something that we're just not exposed to, and we're not interacting with on a daily basis in a way that people in British Columbia are. And you're right, then the, the the complicated geometry, the you know the it it really resonates with me. And I and I've re I've been trolling through eBay trying to find baskets that I now know are Oregon baskets <laughs> that um, that are not are poorly marked. But um, you know, um, yes, go ahead. Uh, you haven't mentioned uh, anything about the select sub agency that uh, was here in Dodge for 15 years ago. You know, I did not know that until I arrived here. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm fascinated by that history, and I know some people in this room have worked on reclaiming that history, and that's amazing that um, this. You know the trail that Don was telling me about the this this connection back to your own history. It it I think that part of what we run from in Oregon is that the, some of the history is painful, and it's I think that it's okay to say it's painful, but it still needs to be said, and we've got to interact with it, and it is part of this history in this place. Doesn't mean it has to keep going that way. But so I really applaud the efforts that are here and, and to really try to tell that story. That's really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, another comment about the dwellings. Um, and we talk about teepees. And a lot of people don't realize there were Plains Indians. Mm -hmm. As far as the North West Indians, I understand what influenced their dwellings with the cedar because it was very easy to work. They were soft wood, very easy to work, and it, it would never rot. So I understand that had an influence on on their living. I don't understand the ramifications of that, but it, it, it's in there. So. Well, and the and the cedar uh, woven cedar mats that were used to throw over the to put over the wigwams, they could be easily rolled up and transported. You could take an entire house and move it pretty quickly if you're a nomadic. Yeah, it, it's very easy to work, uh, and uh, sometimes when it comes off the street. It's been 20 years since I saw that collection, and I did not know what I know now. So I need to make a beeline there next time I'm um, in England, um, because I, I think a lot of because a lot of the Oregon basketry were they were quite utilitarian. I think they weren't valued until the skills were lost, and then people were scrambling trying to figure out 
how do we get these particular tribal styles and that sort of thing. Um, and so much, you know, as, as people mentioned, so much was lost because a lot of different groups were lumped together who had different traditions and that sort of thing. Because the British got here before that happened. Yeah, the, the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company con collected quite a bit, and um, uh, they were interacting with the Native people here um, shortly after Lewis and Clark. That's who was here. It was um, Hudson Bay Company and French tra uh, trappers and traders. Yeah, but it was the Hudson Bay Company's the British. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they collected that. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, the art of uh, decoration was to tell where you came from so that they could tell the difference between each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's been lost. But another thing, you started out by uh, mythology and uh, iconography. Mm -hmm. And there is not too much mythology available from the Oregon time. There, there is. Um, it, a lot, there are a lot of stories that were recorded by early missionaries and um, early ethnographers that are talking about um, creation legends and that sort of thing. But there actually is quite a bit of mythology. Do they show up in the iconography? I don't see it because I can't, I guess I'm not, I'm too linear. I'm, I'm trying to see how some of the stories that I read show up in that way. But, I haven't yeah. been able to draw such a straight line as I did from Zunaqua. Just uh, let, let me try this. Uh, Bellingham, uh, Washington. We have the Wall of uh, Seattle. We have our Chief Seattle. Bellingham, Washington. Beautiful country, right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for a lovely night, and I really, uh, I just enjoyed uh, my time exploring this area and. Thank you so much for, uh, I'm very jealous of this, uh, the commons, because you put on some great programs. So thanks so much, guys.